Hello, this is Sheen and welcome to my YouTube channel. In this psychological experiments video, I want to discuss some experiments that were done by Martin Sigmund and Stephen Mayer on the topic of learned helplessness. So what is learned helplessness? Essentially, Sigmund and Mayer wanted to see whether it is possible to train an animal or a human? Is it possible to condition them to expect pain, suffering or discomfort without a way to escape it? Essentially, they wanted to know whether it's possible to condition animals and human beings so that they feel that they are helpless. That's what learned helplessness means. It's essentially when humans or animals start to understand or believe that they have no control over what happens to them. They begin to think, feel and act as if they are helpless. And this phenomenon is called learned helplessness because it's not an innate trait. No one is born thinking that they are helpless and they have no control over what happens to them. So at the time, Sigmund and Mayer were working with dogs and testing their responses to electric shocks. And this is where the experiment starts to get disturbing. Some of these dogs received electrical shocks that they had no control over and some didn't. Then the dogs were placed in a box with two chambers divided by a low barrier and one chamber had an electrified floor while the other didn't. When the researchers placed the dogs in the box and turned on the electrified floor, they noticed a very strange thing. Some dogs didn't even attempt to jump over the low barrier to the other side. Further, the dogs who didn't attempt to jump the barrier were generally the dogs who had previously been given shocks with no way to escape them. And the dogs who jumped the barrier tended to be those who had not received such treatment. To investigate this phenomena further, Sigmund and Mayer gathered a new batch of dogs and divided them into three groups. Dogs in group 1 were strapped onto a harness for a period of time and were not given any electric shocks whatsoever. This was the control group, essentially. Dogs in group number 2, the dogs were strapped into a hammock but were given electric shocks. 64 inescapable electric shocks, each for 5 seconds and of 6.0 microampere, which is moderately painful. These shocks were not predicted by any signal and they occurred randomly, which they could avoid by pressing a button with their noses. And dogs in group number 3 were placed in the same harness and also given electric shocks, but they had no way to avoid them. Once these three groups had completed this first experimental manipulation, all dogs were placed one at a time in the box with two chambers with an electrifying floor. Either of the chambers could be electrified in this case. Then the floors of the chamber in which the dog was placed was electrified and all the dog had to do to avoid the shock was to jump. That's all that the dog needed to do. When the first electric shock was given to the naive dog, the dog ran frantically until it accidentally scrambled over the barrier and escaped the shock. On the next trial, the dog running frantically crossed the barrier more quickly than the preceding trial. Within a few trials, the animal became very efficient at escaping and soon learned how to avoid the shocks altogether. After about 50 trials, the dog became nonchalant and stands in front of the barrier. And at the onset of the signal for a shock, the dog jumps over the barrier nonchalantly. 
Dogs from group number one and group number two were quick to figure out that they only needed to jump over the barrier to avoid the shocks. But most dogs from group number three didn't even attempt to avoid them. They didn't even attempt to jump over the barrier. Such a dog's first reaction to the shock was similar to the one of the naive dog. He ran about frantically for about 30 seconds. But then the dog stopped moving and the dog laid down and started quietly whining. After one minute, the shock ends automatically and the dogs in the third group failed to cross the barrier and escape the shock. At first, the dog struggled a bit, but then after a few seconds, the dog seemingly just gave up and passively accepted the shock and that he or she couldn't do anything about it. And in all succeeding trials, the dogs from group number three continued to fail to escape the shock. You know, we all learn from our experiences, right? And based on their previous experiences, these dogs concluded that there was nothing that could be done to avoid these shocks. And as horrifying as it may seem, this was actually an important discovery in learned behavior. However cruel it might seem today, this was an important discovery in learned behavior at the time. And this was later performed not just on dogs, but also on other animals. And they showed the same behavior. They also learned that they were helpless. And usually I don't even discuss whether or not these experiments are worth it or not. Because, you know, it's a controversial topic. It really depends on the person. I, for one, don't know whether they are worth it or not. I don't even want to discuss that. But I do want to discuss some ways in which learned helplessness comes up in psychology and in real life. For example, in circuses, there are elephants, right, who perform in the circus. When an elephant trainer starts working with a baby elephant, he or she uses a rope to tie one of the elephant's legs down to a post. The baby elephant tries and struggles for hours to escape the rope, but eventually it fails because the rope is strong and because the elephant is a baby elephant. It's not a grown-up elephant. So what happens next? The baby elephant quietly sits down and accepts that, hey, that's all I could do and I cannot go outside of the circle. But when the elephant grows up, it becomes very strong, right? Elephants are strong creatures and they are so strong that they can break the rope. But when the elephant grows up, they don't even try to break the rope. They have just accepted that they can only move inside the circle and that the rope is unbreakable. They have learned that they are helpless. Even though they are not helpless, they could break the rope if they wanted to because they are grown ups now. But because they have been conditioned to believe that they are helpless, right from the beginning, right from their birth, they don't even try to break the rope. They have been taught that any kind of struggle is useless. Learned helplessness actually also comes up in academics, in how early academic failure or low academic self-esteem can impact later success, and how the relationship can be influenced to enhance the chances of success. Learned helplessness in students creates a vicious cycle. Those who feel that they are unable to um, succeed or even if they put in effort, they are likely to fail, leads to decreased chances of success in that subject. 
or just in school in general. Which then leads to more lack of motivation and effort, which turns into a vicious cycle. This vicious cycle may result in a student having no motivation to study or learn a subject. They might even start to think that they can't learn that subject. Or worse, it could lead to a more generalized sense of helplessness in which the student thinks that they cannot learn any subject at school and they might start to think that they are dumb or that they are stupid and may decide to drop out. This phenomenon of learned helplessness also comes up in a topic which I am particularly interested in. Um, domestic violence and abuse. I remember doing a channel poll about three months ago asking whether you guys have experienced any sort of abuse or have been in an abusive relationship and shockingly most of you guys have said yeah you guys have been in an abusive relationship which was shocking to me because I thought that maybe the split might be at 50-50, you know, 50% experienced an abusive relationship and 50% didn't. But the split was more along the lines of 75-25, which was shocking to me. In fact, this phenomenon has helped us find an answer to some questions people have for the victims of abuse who stay in their abusive relationships. Like, for instance, domestic abuse. You know, why didn't they tell someone? Why didn't they try to get help? Why didn't they just leave? The door was open. It's hard to explain the impact of abuse on the victim's behavior. After all, you know, people from the outside might think that it makes no sense for the victims to stay with someone who hurts them on a regular basis. However, you know... If you've been in that situation, and according to the poll that I had conducted, most of you have been in a situation like that. You know what it's like. In cases of domestic abuse and even sexual abuse, you know, um, repeated sexual abuse, um, abusers often give quote-unquote electric shocks to their victims. To get them familiar with the abuse and to teach them that they have no control over the situation and that the victims maintain complete control and the victim learns that they are helpless about their circumstances whether it be you know because um, they are financially tied or they have children or anything along those lines. In such cases, you know, it's easy to see how abuse could lead to learned helplessness and its impact could stay even after the victim leaves the abuser. And actually, based on learned helplessness, a specific theory of domestic violence was developed, which is known as the theory of cyclical abuse. You know, the stage one is the tension building stage where the abuser starts to get really angry, communication breaks down. Stage two is the acting out period, you know, when the abuser abuses the victim. Stage three is the honeymoon period, you know, uh, the abuser tries to convince the victim that everything is going to be fine and okay and for some time it is fine and it is okay, but it doesn't stay that way. Then comes stage number four, the calm period. And this is when the victim starts to think that the abuse has stopped and this will not continue on. And they think that it, it, it's all over. And then it happens again and again and again. This is the theory of cyclical abuse and it was developed based on learned helplessness. So yeah, that was the video about learned helplessness let me know what you guys think about this whole situation um the question that i would be really interested in is whether or not do you 
think that these experiments, these horrifying experiments were worth it or not. Because even though these experiments were horrifying, and they are, they are very cruel. Are they worth it if, if it helps people, if it helps domestic abuse victims, you know? Like for instance, I haven't mentioned this in this video because the video is getting way too long. Um, but there have been theories that have been developed on how to treat learned helplessness based on uh, these sorts of experiments. So I wonder whether or not these sorts of experiments were worth it. Let me know what you guys think. I for one don't know. Because like, you're hurting animals. These sorts of experiments were conducted on many other animals, like rats. And like I've said, you know, elephants as well. And the elephant one, you know, that still happens in circuses. I don't know whether all of that pain is worth it or not. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Also, by the way, I just got eligible for our channel memberships. So if you like these psychological experiments videos and you have some money that you don't know what to do with, you can become a member of this channel by clicking that little join button. I would really appreciate it. It helps me put more hours into this thing that I absolutely love to do. Um, like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, by the way. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.